Hey, Kath, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, listen, I've known you now for a while, and I think something that I, the question I've always got, had asking for you is, I, I get to meet some incredible people who usually have a, had a career and had amazing success in that career and done incredible things. I get to hear about them and it's an inspirational story and I enjoy it so much. And yet I'm sitting with you today and you've decided to go and have multiple careers and be an amazing success of both. And I think my question starts, and the, what was your plan when you were growing up? Did you, was it the sport or was it the diplomat business life? So there's a huge assumption there that there was a plan. Of course, yes. Uh, so that's probably the first thing to, to kind of address. I think I had, probably had multiple plans. I think probably uh, most people have a variety of things. I think I might want to do this, I might want to do that. I definitely didn't have a set one that I wanted to do. Actually, sport didn't figure at all okay. growing up. So um, I did quite a lot of music and I was a reasonably serious mu uh, pianist. And so that probably was the thing that spent most of my time. Uh, and then did a variety of other things. I always loved kind of travelling languages. That was definitely my passion and what I went on to study. So I think I was always interested in something that might take me abroad. And I guess, you know, training and rowing took me to lots of lakes mm. and diplomacy took me abroad. So I suppose there was something there. But I've always had quite a curiosity to explore what's possible. And actually, all of these different routes have been means of just exploring and finding out about different worlds. So was it almost like you had a goal of that, you wanted to achieve more, and the how you did it, you didn't really care about? I think I was curious. Okay. I'm not even sure it was totally achievement focused. It was about finding out what's out there, what's in the wide world, what, what is there beyond my kind of fairly narrow views growing up, you know, what, what, what exists, what's possible. So I think I'm always driven by that. So then, okay, so but then still the diplomatic route and the sporting route. Tell me about kind of what are the similarities between the two, because I mean, to me, one of them is highly competitive and kind of all about being the best. And the other one is about finding a solution involving all different people um, and make, I suppose making compromises, which presumably in sport is the anaesthetist of winning. So I think the context look quite different, but for people within them, it's about performing under pressure, mm. being uh, in really challenging circumstances. It's challenging to sit on the start of an Olympic start line. It's challenging to be trying to stabilise uh, a political situation. And as a human in those scenarios, you're thinking about what can I do? What's within my control? What, how do I manage the stress, the pressure? What are my options? Um, how am I going to work with people around me? How can I best use them? So the, the experience wasn't so different, even though you're right, the context is totally different. And this, the, the outcomes you might be working to look different. And one is clear cut and one isn't. Yeah. But actually within that, I've still got to think about what's my contribution? What's my performance? What can I do in each of these scenarios to get closest to the outcome that I want? We talk a lot about high performance. I mean, that's very much where we're at at the now. But it used to be about success or maybe it still is about success of winning. Looking back now in terms of sport, was it about kind of, are you interested in winning or was it about achieving what you could achieve? So I think this is something I'm still really fascinated by. And I think I was always trying to work out this question mm. and you have some different motivators in there. Certainly it's great to win and, and you want to see how good you can be. And and that's held up for you as what you're aiming for. And you certainly, are, you know, that, that's something you can be excited to take on. I think there's also something about that finding out process and the performance piece around what am I capable of? And how do I work with the people around me? It's a brilliant setup in order to explore what's possible. It's a brilliant setup in terms of some fantastic high performance minded people that mm. you get to connect with, that together, maybe you can also achieve something more than you could on your own. Um, I think sort of the psychology has also shifted in this area a lot. So sports psychology, when I started back in sort of the Atlanta Olympics, yeah. was very much about the will to win, yeah. being tough. And it's all if you haven't won, basically you didn't want it enough or you weren't kind of quite tough enough. That, that was sort of around the questions that were being asked uh, and, and the language that was used by coaches and sports psychologists. That's completely changed now into this much more performance driven approach that separates out the performance you control as an athlete from the result. I can't control the result. I can't control how fast the rest of the world go. But I can control how well I do and how close I get to what I'm capable of getting to without any ceiling on what that might be. What's my best performance? And we see that that's a better catalyst to getting the best out of me, myself. But so, 
um, I, I spoke to Steve Ingham a while ago and he was talking about success and one of the things he was talking about was Usain Bolt with his immense amount of natural talent. He could have achieved so much more than he actually achieved, even though kind of the fastest man in the world, et cetera, et cetera. But does that mean that almost there's somewhere in the middle we haven't really got to yet from a, from a, I suppose from a, in a, in a sporting world, which means that balance of driven by success and ability against the high performance um, scientific approach, there's something in the middle which we haven't, we've gone from one extreme to the other, I suppose. So I think for, for me, I'd put it also in a short term, long term view. We tend to want short term results and think that success is about that rather than seeing the long term. So again, with um, you know, a, a longer view back on my sporting career, yeah. actually the results are only a part of it. Actually the experience I had, the things I learned, the friendships, the connections I made, some of those things are as important to who I am. Mm. You know, how I dealt with really difficult situations, whether it was losing, whether it was a really difficult coach, whether it was a you know, difficult injury situation, those are part of what I take with me as well. And in fact, I carry that around more than, I don't carry the medal around anymore, but that's part of who I am. Yeah. So I think it's having a, a wider sense of what success might be. Yes, the medal is a part of it. We love that, we want that, but it shouldn't stop there. The story is also about what happened on the way and what you take into what comes next. You know, nor does life stop after the medal. And do you think you got that through your diplomatic work? Because that, to me, smacks a very diplomatic um, viewpoint over actually you're going on a journey altogether in order to achieve what you're looking to achieve because there's no definition necessarily of what success is. Um, or do you think you have that in you and you would, have, you would have had that way? Because to me, that's a really interesting way of thinking and a very reflective way of thinking. And I wouldn't necessarily get that, expect that, sorry, not get that, but expect that from a sports someone who's been in high performance sport? Yeah, I think it's developed over time, looking back on my sporting career, then the diplomatic career, and now going into businesses and seeing again this sort of short termism that drives some behaviours that don't get you where you want to get to in the longer term, that are driven by a sense of I must achieve something, I must hit these targets that are in the next quarter. And yet in the bigger picture, we're not really moving forward. We're not really seeing the bigger gains that could be made. So I think it's looking back through all of those worlds which did give me some different angles on mm. how do you determine what success means. And certainly in the diplomatic world, I spent a lot of time thinking, OK, I knew, I knew the measure in the sporting world. It's wonderfully simple. What is the measure here? We're not going to achieve world peace mm. on the 23rd of February, uh, you know, at three o'clock. So, so what is it that's gonna, that, that I can do? What, what can I move on here? I can't change some of the really big political stuff either. Mm. Uh, what, where can I have an influence? I need to know that if I'm going to bring my best and feel this is worth putting my time into. Um, so I think that did start me thinking about what, what is success really about. Mm -hmm. But actually looking back at sport, I think it's similar. And if you see some of the more recent issues that have come up around you know, difficulties of athletes transitioning after sport, um, you know, stories of actually kind of mental health challenges, then that also says to me you know, in, in, in sport there needs to be a, a rebalancing of, of that perspective. And stepping into the business world, which you're now in, I suppose, how, what's your view of it in terms of where that sits in that difference between sport and um, the diplomatic world? Where is business? How forward thinking is business in terms of the long term aims? Or is it just about the revenue and how, how successful they're doing? So those two things shouldn't actually aren't actually disconnected. And I think, you know, this this is a, a sort of a there's a binary sense of I'm either going for, for revenue or, or, or I'm not kind of in the game. Whereas actually the long term thinking gets you better revenue, but you're just not using that as the kind of only measure to get there. You're looking more broadly at what delivers that rather than just sort of short term factors that will I'll get me revenue revenue in the short term, but maybe some other things you invest in that will get you even more revenue. But we're not only revenue focused, yeah. if you like. I mean, obviously, there's a huge range of different ideas happening across business, so there's a big spectrum. I see the start of a shift to looking at this as part of the culture because people realise that um, you know, performance, productivity, engagement that's flatlined whilst mm. people are working longer and longer hours means we haven't got this right and we need to look at it differently. I think younger generations, more diverse workforces are asking questions. But I was going to say to you, do you think it's, about... it's going to be driven from bottom up or yeah. top down? Well, both, I hope. And I think when leaders at the top see it, they can facilitate the changes required. Okay. So I think when it's driven sort of bottom up, the leaders have, have a choice whether they respond or not. If they don't respond, then people will leave. Mm. And then they won't achieve what they want to achieve either. I think a lot of leaders are hearing these 
uh, different voices, a different perspective, and, and then they need to adapt and think about things in a different way. I mean, another shift that's happening as part of this is around a focus on the culture and the environment rather than the individuals in it. Yeah. So previously people would get sort of sent on a leadership training course or sent on something or developed as you've got to change something, you've got to develop. But now, you know, if you come back into the same environment, you probably can't put into practice half of what you learned because it depends on what that environment allows, what other people around you are doing. In fact, you come back and you're more, more sort of pissed off with things if yeah. you've learned some great things and nobody's interested in working like that. And so that responsibility from leaders is increasing towards realising their job is to think about that environment and that culture. Now, that's less easy to measure, so it requires quite a lot of thought, mm. quite a lot of time, quite a lot of looking at your workplace in different ways, listening to people in the workplace in different ways. But the gains then in the longer term, I think, are much richer and add that sustainability, if you like, to get away from that short-termism that can feel really fragile. So flip-flopping you a bit and going back to dip your diplomatic mm. life, what you talked about then, did that happen in diplomatic circles in terms of you understood the environment you were in and how, how easy it was in that environment um, if you set it up right to actually achieve what you're looking to achieve? Because I imagine in the sporting world, of course it's set up like that. And in the business world, you said it's moving like that. What I wonder in, in the diplomatic world, when you're dealing with all different types of people, did, could you actually manufacture a situation whereby, because of the environment, you could achieve what you want to achieve? Or was it just you were stuck in wherever you were stuck at that moment in time and you had to deal with what you had to deal with? So just to come back to the sporting world piece, it's not completely set in the sporting world. Okay. And we've seen people challenging the cultures within British cycling, within various Olympic sports. Yeah. So actually sport is still learning to do this well, okay. that actually a medal in itself, if it's done in the wrong way, that doesn't respect an athlete, that's actually not where we want to get. Yeah. And it won't get you sustainable medals either. So I think, you know, we've seen a shift in culture. Gareth Southgate, the hero of the moment, we all love him. You know, I love the way he talks. He changes uh, the concept of what performance is about. He's a great example of that. And the culture that he set up, completely different. And that enables them to bring their best on in the pitch. So actually, I think sport is still learning and developing this yeah. in order to get to the next level of performance. I think, you, you know, you're, you're right in the diplomatic world. Um, we had to look at the environment because that affected how people will come together or mm. think about things differently. The challenge is some of that's in your control, some of that isn't. In hostile environment, it's probably less of that is in your control. Yeah. And that's why it's even harder to get to, uh, a, you know, a, a good outcome or just a, a slightly improved outcome or just moving forward and still speaking to one another kind of outcome. There was definitely a, a contrast for me or a learning piece between when I started off, um, you know, I really focused on, you know, knowing the politics, the history, the briefs, the technical mm. briefs about whatever we were negotiating. You get really buried in the detail of that. And it's important, mm. you know, the text, what each word means, that's really important. But actually, when you get in the room, it's about how you connect with people in that room and what can you do to get that environment to be one where people want to move forward, where you've got some connections on a human level, where you've got something in common, even though culturally, historically, politically, linguistically, you've got lots that isn't in common. How can you find something? Because that's the key to influencing, negotiating, moving people, not just sort of saying, I've got the best plan, here we go, I've got the answers, I'm the expert, this is the best way to, to solve this issue or to stabilise this society, this country. No one's gonna buy into that. We see around us all the time. Experts aren't listened to anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't move us, doesn't really persuade us. So that art of persuasion is thinking about what are all the tools I've got, and environment is one of them, in order to try and make some connections, to try and, and make sure I can you know, get, get people to, to see things in a different way, and, and most importantly for me to see how they're seeing the world. So did you see, kind of in the diplomatic, in sporting, and in business life, do you, did you see traits of people you, you come across who actually, which were similar, who were, who were good at this persuasion, who were, um, is there certain things that people could pick up on in terms of improving themselves? Definitely. I mean, I think in the diplomatic world, it's the, the fundamental part of what we do. So I think we spend a lot of time and effort on this and we're very open about investing in this. You know, our business is persuading people to do things they initially probably don't want to do or, you know, finding ways of building partnerships with, you know, the unlikeliest of, of allies, if you like, in order to move a situation forward. So I think we, we really recognise the need to do that and to invest time in that. And therefore, a lot of our debriefs around negotiating teams, around, you know, meetings, is you know not just okay what came out in the text or what's the next step but how are people feeling about this 
you know, are, are they going to go back on this in a week's yeah. time? Are they really bought into this? What more can we do? And who could, who's best in the negotiating team to go and actually, you know, build a bit more on that link? Because again, in certain scenarios and in certain cultures, people sort of just fit in well, or you've just got a connection, yeah. actually. This guy's really into Olympic sport. You know, there was, there was some, some guys when I was working in, in Bosnia, some politicians who, you know, loved talking about when they had the Winter Olympics there in you know, the days of when Torvalindin won their wonderful gold medal. And, uh, you know, they, they loved that side of it. So they wanted to talk about sports. So they were just that bit more relaxed, a bit more open. And, and so I could build some rapport and, and, and get those conversations going before we got to the difficult political stuff. In another scenario, somebody else has sort of got that connection. And so actually they might be the lead in taking that connection, that relationship forward. So, you know, as with everything, there isn't a formula. Yeah. It's about how you go about it and adapt to, you know, getting the most out of everyone in the team. What have you all got to offer in that scenario? Yeah. Who's best place to do what? Let's shift around roles a bit. Um, you know, and, and thinking on your feet then about what, what can we do differently? So, and so kind of going... How do you think that kind of to me that's about trust of your fellow kind of colleagues and understanding their skills and what where they're good at and be able to turn around and say hey I'm not perfect for this mm. you go and do it and then not feeling like you're, you're almost undermining yourself and downgrading yourself in the business world where it is there's a hell of a lot of bravado and there's a hell of a lot of kind of positioning yourself is that something we could learn from and it's on a kind of and how do you overcome that whole thing where you're almost educated that in order to get ahead you've got to put yourself ahead kind of you've got to put yourself out there even if someone else might be better off at the whole thing so that depends on what gets rewarded in your organization if that's what gets rewarded that's what's going to happen that's mm. going to drive that behavior and some organizations yeah that's that's kind of how it works and that's self-perpetuating then it's hard to change that but if people decide that isn't what we want because actually that inhibits collaboration and innovation and actually our business needs those things in order to stay competitive in order to be able to kind of move with what's happening in the wider marketplace then we've got to change some of that so we actually maybe we don't want to reward people for that anymore if we want people to collaborate and I hear a lot about wanting more collaboration in organizations we've got to shift the way teams are set up what they get rewarded for what we are telling people it matters so you say you hear it how much do you think companies are actually doing it or are they paying lip service so I mean, some of them have to do it in order to survive. Mm. Some of them want to do it because they want to do well. Um, some are sticking heads in the sand. I think there's a real mixture. Okay. Ultimately, I think the world is so competitive that if you're not maximising um, you know, what, what you can get out of your teams, then you probably won't survive in the long term. So you're, you're probably only going to play a bit of a short-term <coughs> game there. Um, and there's a, there's a, a, you won't retain talent. You won't attract talent. You know, you're going to cut yourself off in the longer term. So again, you're making some decisions to prioritise surviving in the short term that I think will really hurt you in the longer term. And I think people are seeing that. There's, a, of course, a gradation across the piece. <coughs> Sorry. Um, what's next for you? Kind of, how's the music going, I should ask? That's <laughs> on. How's the music? Uh, so well, I'm, I'm always, I remain curious about performance in all sorts of different worlds. And uh, whether that's, yeah, you know, working with organisations, still connections into sport, bringing up a family um, and, and all that that involves that stretches my mind as well. Um, I think I'm particularly interested in this issue of success and how it plays out. Mm. Um, and I've really started kind of gathering some stories about, you know, this obsession with winning, if you like. I hear that in, in the workplace and people come to, come to me and say, well, you know, coming from sport, come and help us to win. And then I sort of say, well, what, what are you trying to win and why and well, what's the best way to, to kind of get that and why is that important what's the bigger gain you're trying to achieve and, and actually get away from this sense of it's win or lose yeah. it's about growing it's about evolving adapting to what's happening around you um, and there's a longer win if you like there's a longer term win where do you want to get to what's the difference you want to make rather than what do you want to do by the next quarter and so I'm trying to sort of develop a, a kind of a long win thinking uh, if you like, a, a sort of long win perspective to help organisations to see things in a broader lens that will help them uh, be more successful in a sustainable way, that will get rid of some of the short term um, stresses and, and to think about how you're driving behaviour through what you reward, what you, what you su say is success or not, um, so that they can maintain, maintain the sort of talent pool they've got, you know, increasingly get more diverse people coming in and, and you know, stay ahead of the game by being imaginative and, and letting people bring their whole selves to work 
not constraining what they do and don't want, but thinking about actually how do we get the best out of the people we've got? I don't know how long we've got. Can I just ask one more question? If, got if your career would have been in reverse and you've done diplomacy before sport, would this, would this kind of mature, mature kind of different outlook um, have a, affected your sporting achievements? Or do you think kind of actually you need to go in it with the naivety of, not naivety, sort of kind of the enthusiasm of I can achieve anything, I can do anything and actually it's all down to me? So I, I think I still felt in diplomacy, there's a lot down to me to make something happen. Mm. Um, I mean, it's interesting that I did start my diplomatic career before I ended my sporting career okay. and then went on to have my greatest success. Yeah. So my best success. So I think, you know, what really helped me, I went to uh, two Olympics, came seventh, then came ninth and had a crisis about, oh, what's, you know, what's performance about? You know, why am I getting this wrong? And, you know, am I any better than that? Can I find another way to, to get a better result? And it was actually then that I stepped out and went back to a world I'd originally wanted to join. I'd wanted to be a diplomat, but the sport thing has to happen when you're younger um, in a way that that's just the way it works. Um, but actually stepping out into that diplomatic world gave me such a great perspective on there are bigger issues in the world than my boat going backwards as fast as possible. Um, there's a wider world of stuff out here that's going on um, regardless of how fast you go. And that gave me the different perspective to step back into that world where all that matters is how fast mm. my boat goes um, and perform in a better way because I just had this wider perspective that enabled me to still focus on that performance at the end of the day, but have it situated within the fact there's a life that goes on after this mm -hmm. and there are other things that happen regardless of whether I win or lose that are actually, frankly, a lot more important um, that then enabled me to, you know, win medals. So do you think, like the US system where they have to stay in college, they're, they're mandated to stay in college before they can go and turn professional as a sports person in terms of the world of NBA and NFL and all these other things, do you think that's a healthy thing because actually you get the slightly more worldly experience having gone to university. I think having just something that gives you a wider perspective yeah. is really important and actually some of the professionalisation, if you like, of, you know, Olympic athletes who are full time, you know, with that has definitely put an increased mental pressure on what you're doing because you've got nothing else in your yeah. life if it goes wrong. And it's very fragile. You can easily lose, you can easily get ill, you can easily get injured. Um, so we all need that sort of ability to switch off and think about something in a broader perspective in order to then actually switch on and, and perform. So I think there's a switch back to helping athletes be connected to either some part-time work or studying. So I think it can be created, but we need that. I think we need that in the workplace as well, to keep learning, mm. to keep growing, to be able to switch off from that intense day-to-day, -day, reflect about uh, you know, something different that gives you another perspective. I think that's important all the way along, even more so in our world where we don't switch off. Actually, what are we doing to step back and get some different perspective. Brilliant. Listen, thank you so much indeed for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Um, and I look forward to chatting to you further. Likewise, for me too. Cheers. Thank you.